Hey, Tanya. Good morning. Good morning, Michelle. Did you guys hear a notice? I think my sister's still not getting the notices. Good morning, though. Uh, but today's Sunday, so jammy Sunday, but I'm not putting that in the title again. That was crazy. Hey, Nina. I ordered that uh, other version of the translation of the Dow, Nina. It won't be here till Monday, though. But I was going to compare it to the one I have and see if I liked it better. Hello. Hello, Cynthia. Hi, everybody. All the leaves are falling. Okay, good. Hello, Kristen. Kristen? Chrissy? Gosh, I'm sorry. So bad with the names. So, a uh, quick oil tip for you oil users, because I had to remix my bottle. Hi, Annalisa. A mix of lemon, lavender, and peppermint equal parts in one of your spare oil bottles. Oh, <laughs> Good. <laughs> Kristen. And then you smell it. it. smells terrible. Hi, Rhonda. But it really works for allergies. It works 90% of the time. I've really been... Uh, I don't have to take Claritin much anymore. I do still have to take it in, like, super bad pollen times, but this takes care of it. So if you're an essential oil user, lemon, peppermint, and lavender, equal parts. Shake it up. Roll it. You're not supposed to shake it, I guess. Yeah, and then you just carry it around, smell it a few times a day. I used to put it on my skin, but um, you don't really have to put it on your skin. You really can just smell it, and then it lasts longer. Sometimes I put it on my skin if I feel like I just really have to, but you don't really have to. So, it's Jammy Sunday, but last Sunday when I put Jammy Sunday, we got we attracted like a, I feel like a lot of trolls who wanted to see jammies. So we're not doing that again. So, today, my name is Michelle Wolf. You can find me at um, caddyshackdesigns.com. I'm a coach. I do Reiki. I'm an artist. Uh, I do a lot of stuff. So, at the website, at the top are tabs that will tell you everything I do. And there's a Facebook tab that will... Um, thanks for sharing, guys. Uh, I really appreciate that. And then, um, on, the, on the Caddyshack website... On the right is information about the next Desire Map workshop. There's a sign-up form for your email if you want to be on the email list. And there's also a button that will take you to the Facebook page. But you can also friend me on Facebook. I'm an open book. Open book on Facebook. <laughs> no point in trying to keep anything a secret these days. Um... If you Google Michelle Wolf with two F's Facebook, my my personal page will come up in the business one. So, <sighs> normally we talk about A Course in Miracles, but we've decided to uh, mix it up a bit. And um, on alternate days, do something a little different. So starting today, we'll do this, then Monday, Course in Miracles, and then we'll flip-flop back and forth. So we are using the... Tao Te Ching Translation by Stephen Mitchell, who is Byron Katie's husband, I'm pretty sure. And then we're using, I've been calling it 10,000 Names for Joy, but it's actually, oh, you're welcome, I really love it. A Thousand Names for Joy is the companion book. So these this these two books are meant to complement each other, but you don't have to have... Obviously, you can read them both separately. You don't have to have them together, and I've never read them together, so this will be fun. Um, in case you don't know... Oh, you do? I just ordered my, my second one. So I'm very interested to dive into it, because um, now that we've been working on A Course in Miracles for a while, I really see a lot of um, parallels, so I want to hear it in a different language. So, um, in case you don't know, Byron Katie is a woman who developed a process called the work. It's very similar. If you're a therapist person, it's similar to, um, rationally motive behavioral therapy. Um, it's looking at your thoughts. Hi, Sarah. And working through them. And so that you can dissect the stories that you tell yourself about life 
and stories can be really limiting. Good morning. Um, we're talking about Byron Katie and the Tao. We're reading these two books together. The Tao Te Ching by Stephen Mitchell and Byron Katie's Thousand Names for Joy. We're going to go through them chapter by chapter. Uh, alternating with Course in Miracles. So, um, so Byron Katie's process is really similar to that. You're looking at an event and you're looking at the thoughts you're telling yourself about that event. So it's not new. Uh, I don't think there's anything new under the sun. Um, except that Starbucks didn't put Merry Christmas on their cups or something. People are upset about it. I don't get it. I don't really care. Uh, although I am happy that Christmas blend is coming back because it is my favorite. And um, so the work, the way Byron Katie set it up, makes it very easy to use. And it's free. It's pretty funny. It's little. It's definitely a first world problem. <laughs> like who gives a crap, okay? <laughs> it's a freaking cup. You're going to drink it and you're going to throw it away. So don't worry about it. It's fine. That wasn't a childhood tradition. Your heart isn't being broken. So there's a perfect example. The stories that people tell themselves about what's on a cup. For some of them, now Christmas is ruined. I can't have a good Christmas. <laughs> it gets Starbucks messed up my cup. <laughs> yeah, so stories. So that's what we're, that's what we're, we talk about stories we tell ourselves a lot, but um, the work gives you a nice format to use. We're so upset about that. I think it's good to be more inclusive. Yeah, a lot of people I know will be, will be upset about that too. Whatever. We, do. we live in a mixing, a, me a melting pot, people. We do. Stop denying it. Thework.com has all the information about Byron Katie's work. She has a ton of videos on YouTube. Yeah. Welcome to the South slash jungle. Um, it's really helpful to take the work sheets and then go watch a bunch of videos. I got to see her live once, and she's an incredibly powerful woman. It To see her in person is like just being bowled over. She's um, amazing. I got to talk to her after, and I literally was struck speechless almost. I stammered like, bye, bye, I like your work, me like your work. She was so kind, because I was like, bah, duh, duh. <laughs> I just... Got struck dumb. I just love her. So anyway, let's get going. <laughs> She's a wonderful woman. She was very kind. <laughs> I got enough sleep. I went to bed late, but I got enough sleep. So let's start. The Dow is written in... Uh, oh, thank you, Sarah. I do you too. I have my mala on under here, too. So the Tao was written by, as far as we know, by a man named Lao Tzu, L-A-O-T-Z-U-E. Maybe have been a contemporary of Confuci Confucius. It sounds like we didn't really know a whole lot about the guy that wrote it. <laughs> but what was written is so profound that it has lasted all these years. Uh, so the best we know is somewhere around 500 B.C., 500 before the Christian era, B.C.E. And it's written as, uh, so the central figure is a man or a woman whose life is in perfect harmony with the way things are. When you study this, it's things getting done without doing, um, non-action happens by non-action. It's a very subtle concept. Um, and it's not easy to do. But when you do it, life flows wonderfully well. Um, it says less and less do you need to force things until finally you arrive at non-action. When nothing is done, nothing is left undone. Which on the surface sounds ridiculous. Um, but it's not. It's actually a very sweet way to live your life in a very calm and peaceful way to live your life. And some of us don't know how to do that because then we're like, well, what am I going to think about? But I can't worry about something. What in, what in the world am I going to think about? Trust me, you can find something. 
So they took this book. Hi, Evie. We're talking about this book at the moment. They took this book, the Tao, Stephen Mitchell's translation, and did it with this book. Had so Byron Katie went through this book chapter by chapter. Hello. Mwah. Uh, and that's how we're going to do it too. So when the chapters are long, I'll paraphrase. I'll probably paraphrase some anyway, but you don't need to run out and buy the book right now unless you just really want to. It's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. Um, this one too. Definitely recommend it. Just when the other translation gets here Monday, I'm going to dive into it and I'll let you know. <clears throat> Sounds like it's a good one. I love that author. So anyway, we'll go chapter by chapter every other day. So let's start. In Byron Katie's book, she uses the pronoun she because she can only speak to her own experience. Okay, that's cool. I think, I don't know how much they differ. Tanya on here has seven. So Tanya, uh, the one by Ursula Legin, G-U-I-N, I never know if I'm pronouncing her name right. She's a, a writer, L-E-G-U-I-N. Do you have that one? I just I just ordered I can't wait to get it. So chapter one. Um and the Tao, I should say, if you aren't familiar with the Tao, it means the way. It just means the way through life, the balanced, harmonious way with what all with the energy that we would call source or some people call God or it's the impersonal thing that makes all of this work that makes us tick that makes our world it's quantum physics you could look at it that way that quantum energy that we can't we the thing that we cannot define but we know is there so let's let's start there take that with a grain of salt ready Chapter 1. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. The unnameable is the eternally real. Naming is the origin of all particular things. Free from desire, <clears throat> you realize the mystery. Caught in desire, you see only the manifestations, the tangible. Yet mystery and manifestations arise from the same source. This source is called darkness. Darkness within darkness, the gateway to all understanding. So in Eastern philosophy, you hear it described as the void. And we're a little bit scared of the void because we can't name it. We can't categorize it. We have a gut level intuitive understanding that it is absolutely unnameable. <clears throat> and it scares the hell out of our ego. Because ego doesn't exist there. We're all one. Everything's one. Everything's flowing like water. And um, that's scary when you want to grip onto the world and control it and categorize it and label it. And tell it a bunch of stories and Bumblebee Planner Mom. Hello. That's a neat name. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. We can't name it. We slap names on it because we need to communicate. But we can't name it, really. So the corresponding chapter in A Thousand Names for Joy goes along with that chapter. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. So this is her book, okay? You can't express reality in words. You limit it that way. We've talked about this before, too, that when you put a label on something, you shut doors to anything alternate. So when you're asking, how can I see this differently, You'll see things in different ways because by asking that question, you've taken that label off. Well, you might as well add to your collection, Tanya. <laughs> Looks like it's a good one. Nina's reading it. Nina, how are you doing, by the way? I was thinking about you the last couple of days. You squeeze it into nouns and verbs and adjectives, and the instant-by-instant instant flow is cut off. You cut off your world when you label, when you box stuff in. The Tao that can be told isn't the eternal Tao because trying to tell it brings it into time. Oh, good. Good, good. It's stopped 
in time by the very attempt to name it. Once anything is named, it's no longer eternal. Eternal means free, without limit, without a position in time or space, lived without obstacle. There's no name for what's sitting in this chair right now. I am the experience of the eternal. Even with the thought, God, it all stops and manifests in time. And as I create God, I have created not God. Did you get that? So when you label something one thing, you instantly create an opposite to it. When you label something God, then you have to label other things not God. You can substitute anything here with the thought tree and not tree. The mechanism is the same. Before you name anything, the world has no things in it. No meaning. There's nothing but peace in a word, wordless, questionless world. It's the space where everything is already answered in joyful silence. In this world, before words, there is only the real, undivided, ungraspable, already present. Any apparently separate thing can't be real since the mind has created it with its name. So you see how it parallels A Course in Miracles? Um, the real is only that which exists without our language on it. The timeless. So, when we understand this, the unreal becomes beautiful because there's nothing that can threaten the real. I don't ever see anything separate called tree or you or I. These things are only imagination, believed or unbelieved. Naming is the origin of all the particular things. Something life-saving is discovered. There's also something that destroys that. Yeah. Our world is that, our life is that... Yeah, yeah, that's a good example. Um, we're always walking that razor's edge between light and dark, that very thin, thin line uh, where we so easily wobble around like toddlers trying to walk, which, by the way, Ashlyn pulled up by herself yesterday. Thank God we thought that kid was never going to start walking. And she's the heaviest one, too, so ouch. Gigi's shoulders a little thrown out every week. <laughs> <coughs> So she calls this, I know, right? she calls this first generation thinking to break off a part of something and give it a name is first generation thinking. So first we say tree, then thought begets thought. So then we have tree, tall tree, beautiful tree, tree that I wonder, that want to sit under, tree that would make good furniture, tree that I need to save. And that's where story arises from. So there is the thing that exists in time and space that we can touch that's called tree. And then that's the first generation thinking, as she calls it. Everything that comes after that is our story about it. Naming and labeling creates other. It creates the separateness. It, creates, uh, it strengthens our illusion that I and the tree are separate and that I can use the tree um, you know, it creates the story. That's how stories get told. There's tree, and that's where it starts. Then there's beautiful tree, uh, tree that drops leaves I have to rake, tree that sends up shoots that I don't like. You know, that's how people get wrapped up in their stories. That's how it begins. That's the actual physical, mechanical process of how your storytelling begins. We do the same thing with people. There is a person in front of us, then we start wrapping them up and tying them down with our labels and our story about them. If they're a certain color, we tell a story. If they have a certain socioeconomic appearance, we tell a story. And we're often wrong. There's a lot of very wealthy people that go around looking like bums, looking Hollywood. What is the deal with Johnny Depp went for, like didn't take a shower for two years? What the hell was that was about? Labels. That's how we tell our story. If they're a woman, we tell a story. If they're a man, we tell a story. If they're a white man, we tell a story. If they're a redneck-looking man, we tell a story. So that's how it happens. Our stories are built by labels being stacked on labels by being stacked on labels. Then they're all woven into an emotional response, which gives me the glasses that I see the world with. It's all my glasses that I see the world with is all made up of labels and storytelling. Oh, I will. I haven't even been on there yet. But I will look at it. Yeah. 
he can get away with it. The white guy? <laughs> white men are still the privileged population. Oh, Johnny Depp. Yes. Yeah, he can get away with it. He can do whatever the hell he wants. Because, look at him. <laughs> we give a lot of latitude to the beautiful people. We give a lot of latitude to people with a lot of money. We bestow on them freedoms that we don't give to any other people. That's kind of fucked up. <laughs> okay, so that's how it happens, right? When the mind believes what it thinks, it names what cannot be named and tries to make it... I'll take his shower wet. Avi's like, oh, hell no. I don't care how cute you are or how rich you are. You have to get in there and you wash your dirty butt. <laughs> I forgot to turn my alarms off or my alerts off. Can you guys see that there's an incoming call? You can't hear it. As long as you can't see it, I'm not going to worry about it. It, okay, good. It takes just a moment to question your story and break that spell and wake up. When the mind believes what it thinks, it names what cannot be named and tries to make it real through a name. It believes that names are real and that there's a world out there separate from itself that needs to be labeled and categorized and nailed down. That's an illusion. When you're shut down and frightened, the world seems hostile. When you love what is, and I would say capitalize the word is, uh, everything in the world, hi Kim, everything in the world becomes the beloved. Everything in the world becomes the manifestation of the divine beloved that we can connect to in any moment. But we have to let go of our fear to feel that connection, to feel that safety that we don't have to tell stories anymore. Inside and outside match the reflections of each other. The world is a mirror image of your mind. Not believing your own thoughts, you're free from the primal desire, which is the thought that reality should be different than it is. So we see something and we want to improve on it. We want to do something with it. We want to act. We want to place our will upon it, including people. And that gets us in a world of trouble. Any mystery is only what you yourself have created. In fact, there's no mystery. Everything is clear as day. It's simple because there really isn't anything. There's only the story that's appearing now, 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 now. We're creating our story. In the end, mystery is equal to manifestations. You're just looking from a new perspective. The world is an optical illusion. It's just you. It's just you, crazed and miserable, or it's just you, delighted and at peace. And we get to choose. We get to choose. Are we going to be crazy and miserable today? Or are we going to be delighted with the world in front of us and at peace? And delighted even when there's something going on in front of us that we would label poopy. Is the best word I can think of right now. Some things we call poopy that are not really so. Desire is a gift. It's about noticing. Everything happens for you, not to you. I love the word delighted. Delighted is somewhere beyond joy even for me. Delighted is like a magical word. I have questioned my thoughts and I've seen that it's crazy to argue with what is. I don't ever want anything to happen except what's happening. Here's an example. Everything is poopy. Okay, guys. You may not want to know this story. And I apologize to people who don't follow me regularly. But I have twin granddaughters that are 18 months old. Yesterday, when I was wrapping up my scope, I wrapped it up super quick. Because Avery was walking around flinging her diaper. Naked. Uh, from the waist down. You know, she had a shirt on. And I was like, oh, hell. She's taking her diaper off. She's winging it around. That's her thing lately. So we're buying potty chairs now. Because if she's old enough to say, uh, something happened here and I'm going to take my diaper off, we're going to start playing with potty chairs. Okay, so what happened after that is Ashlyn started screaming and bringing me something. Screaming bloody murder and bringing me something she could hold in her hand. And that's all I'm going to say. And I'll let your imagination do the rest. We had a horrible... We had a pretty horrible about 10 minutes. And we did a lot of antibacterial soap. <laughs> I was like, oh no! Oh no! 
Oh, okay. You can watch the replay if you want to. Ah, it's just part of toddlerhood. My daughter has called twice now, though. So I probably will need to wrap up here quick, fairly quickly. So you get the point here? Here's an example. My 90-year-old mother is dying of cancer. I'm taking care of her, cooking, cleaning, sleeping beside her, living in her apartment 23 hours a day. It's been a month. Her breath is the pulse of my life. I take care of her. She's am I'm amazed at the beauty and intricacies of our bodies. As she's dying, I look more deeply into the eyes that the mind has vacated. The mindless eyes, the eyes of no mind. And she's as present as she ever was. A man sticks a pistol into my stomach, pulls the hammer back, and says, I'm going to kill you. I'm shocked he's taking his thoughts so seriously. To someone identified as an I, the thought of killing causes guilt that leads to a life of suffering. So I ask him, as kindly as I can, not to do it. I don't tell him that it's his suffering I'm thinking of. He says he has to, and I understand. I remember believing that I had to do things in my life, too. I have to. I thank him for doing the best he can, and I notice that I'm fascinated. She talks. She thinks of herself in the third person a lot and talks about herself in the third person a lot these days because she's disidentified with I. I'm fascinated. Is this how she dies? Is this how the story ends? And as joy continues to fill me, I find it miraculous that the story is still going on. You can never know the ending, even as it ends. I'm very moved at the sight of the sky, clouds, and moonlit trees. I love that I don't miss one moment, one breath of this amazing life. Sarah does that, too. Well, Michelle's going to start doing that, too, as a practice, and see where it gets her. <laughs> I wait and wait, and in the end, he doesn't do, he doesn't pull the trigger. He doesn't do that to himself. Have you ever noticed, you Sesame Street watchers, that Elmo talks about himself in third person? Elmo this, Elmo that. Elmo doesn't like that. Elmo likes that. Elmo wants to play. Elmo wants to talk in an annoying, squeaky voice until you want to pull your hair out. Why does he do that? Maybe he, maybe Elmo is an enlightened being. He doesn't do that to himself. Yes, there's another Buddhist story by Sharon Salzberg, I think, where a guy reaches in a... She's in a rickshaw thing in India with her guru, her teacher. Sarah wants to choke Elmo, and Elmo is highly evolved. <laughs> I'm going to have to go with Sarah on that one. <laughs> okay. Somebody reaches in, snatches Sharon Salzberg's purse right out from in front of her. And runs off with that. And her teacher's like, what the hell did you just do? You were holding an umbrella in your hand. You could have whacked him with it and grabbed your purse. And she was like, but I thought I was supposed to let him have it. And she said, of course you weren't supposed to let him have it. Look what he just did to himself. Now he has the bad karma of being a thief and of stealing someone's stuff and of hurting another person. Sometimes you have to stop people from hurting you in order to stop them from hurting themselves. He doesn't pull the trigger because he doesn't do that to himself. What we call bad and what we call good both come from the same place. It's just how we label it. That's the old saying in that one man's trash is another man's treasure. One man's empty uh, water can tote is a, the same man's hot tub, redneck hot tub. Okay, that didn't make sense. Never mind. The Tao says that the source of everything is called darkness. What a beautiful name if we have to have a name. Darkness is our source. In the end, it embraces everything. <laughs> that's bad. No, that's good. <laughs> All our stress results from what we imagine is in that darkness. We imagine it as separate from ourselves and we project something terrible onto it. But in reality, the darkness is always benevolent. We're all just trying to get back to love the best way we know how. And sometimes our ways are clumsy. And sometimes our ways hurt each other. But we really are all trying to do the best we can with what we know. What is the darkness within the darkness? It's the mind that doesn't know a thing. The don't know mind is center of the universe. It is the universe. 
The reason that darkness is the gateway to all understanding is that once the darkness is understood, you're clear that nothing is separate from you. No name, no thought can possibly be true in an ultimate sense. It's all provisional. It's all changing. The only theory that's true is the theory of relativity. It helps us find compassion. Yes, it helps us find compassion with the people who are so, so hard to love. When you realize this, you just have to laugh. There's nothing serious about life or death. That's chapter one of our Tao and our Thousand Names of, for Joy companion reading. That's our Sunday. <clears throat> My daughter has called twice now, so I'm going to wrap it up and go see because uh, she wouldn't call twice unless there was something that she wanted to tell me. So let's hope that she's calling to tell me that Ashlyn's walking, that our little chubster is taking her own steps now. I love her, but she's so hard for me to carry. Okay, love you guys. So much love. Thank you for coming. I really think these two books together are such a gift. Um, fingers crossed. <laughs> Yes. Um, have a lovely day. And uh, let's. we've talked about this before, about having a day with no labels. See how long you can go today without labeling something, with looking at your children as just, thank you, gratitude to you too. Thank you. I like it a lot also. This is good. This is a good way to mix up our Course in Miracles stuff. Okay, love you guys. Happy Sunday. See you tomorrow for Course in Miracles stuff. Okay, take care. Thanks for sticking around and uh, making the magic with me.